The Heavenly Life by James Allen. The might of meekness. The mountain bends not to the fiercest storm, but it shields the flagling and the lamb. And though all men tread upon it, it protects them and bears them up upon its deathly bosom. Even so is it with the meek man, with those shaken and disturbed by now. And the compassionately bent to shield the lowest creature, and though he may be despised, lifts all men up, and lovingly protects them. All glorious, as glorious as the mountain is silent, is the divine man in his silent meekness, like the form, his loving comparison. Is expansive and sublime. Truly, his body, like the mountain's base, is fixed in the valleys, at the midst. But the summit of his being is internally basked in cloudless glory, and lives with the silences. He who has found the meekness has found divinity. He has realized the divine consciousness and knows himself as the one. He also knows all others as the one, though、so、they know it not themselves, being asleep and dreaming. Meekness is a divine quality, and as as such, and as such is all powerful. The meek man overcomes by not resisting and by allowing himself to be defeated. He attains to the supreme conquest. The man who conquers another by force is strong. The man who conquers himself by meekness is mighty. He who conquers another by force will himself likewise be conquered. He who conquers himself by meekness will never be overthrown. For the human cannot overcome the divine. The meek man is triumphant in defeat. Socrates lives more by being put to death. In the crucified Jesus, the risen Christ is revealed. As Stephen, in receiving his stoning, defies the hurting power of stones. The which is real cannot be destroyed. But the only that which is unreal, when a man finds that within him which is real, which is constant, abiding, changeless, and eternal, he enters into that reality, and becomes meek. All the powers of darkness will come against him, but they will do him no harm, and will at last depart from him. The meek man is found in the time of trial, when other men fall. He stands. His patience is not destroyed by the foolish passions of others, and when they come against him, he does not strive nor cry. He knows the utter powerlessness of all evil, having overcome it himself, and lives in the changeless strength and power of the one good. Meekness is one aspect of the operation of that changeless love, which is the heart of all things. It is therefore an imperishable quality. He who lives in it is without fear, knowing the highest and having the lowest under his feet. The meek man shines in darkness. And flourishes in obscurity. Meekness cannot boast, nor advertise itself, nor strive on popularity. It is practiced. It is seen, or not seen, being a spiritual quality. It is perceived only by the eye of the spirit. Those who are not spiritually awakened to see it not. Nor do they love it, being enamored of 
and blinded by worldly shows and appearances. Nor does history take note of the meek man. Its glory is that of who strive the self-aggrandizement. His is a glory of peace and gentleness. History chronicles the earthly, not the heavenly acts. And though he lives in obscurity, he cannot be hidden. How can lie be hid? He continues to shine. After he has withdrawn himself from the world, and is worshipped by the world, which knew him not, that the meek man should be neglected, abused, or misunderstood, is reckoned by him as of no account, and therefore not to be considered, much less resisted. He knows that all such weapons. As the flimsiest and most ineffectual of shadows, to them therefore, who give him evil, he gives good. He resists none, and thereby conquers all. He who imagines he can be injured by others, and who seeks to justify and defend himself against them, does not understand meekness. Does not comprehend the essence and the meaning of life. He abused me. He beat me. He defeated me. He robbed me. In those who harbor such thoughts, hatred will never cease. For hatred ceases not by hatred at any time. Hatred ceases by love. What a sight! Thou, thy neighbor, has spoken thee falsely. Well, what of that? Can the falsity hurt thee? That which is false is false, and there is an end of it. It's without life, and without power, to hurt any, but him who seeks to hurt by it. It's nothing to thee that thy neighbor should speak falsely of thee, but it's much to thee that thou shouldst resist him. And seek to justify thyself, for by so doing, thou givest life and vitality to thy neighbor's falseness, so that thou art injured or distressed. Take all evil out of thy own heart, then shalt thou see the folly of resisting it in another. Thou wilt be trodden down. Thou art trodden already, if thou sinkest us. The injury that is unseized, as coming from another, comes only from thyself. The wrong thought, or word, or act of another, has no power to hurt thee unless thou galvanize it into life by thy impassioned resistance, and so receive this into thyself. If any man slander me, that is his concern. Not mine, and I had to do with my own soul, not with my neighbor's. So all the world misjudged me. It's no business of mine, but that I should possess my soul in purity and love. That is all my business. There shall be no end to strife until men cease to justify themselves. He who would have war cease, let him cease to defend any party. Let him cease to defend himself. Not by strife can peace come, but by ceasing from strife. The glory of Caesar resides in the resisting of his enemies. They resist, and the fall gives Caesar that which Caesar demands, and Caesar's glory and power are gone. Thus, by submission, does the meek man conquer the strong man? But it is not that our world shows of submission, which is slavery. It is an ingrowed and the spiritual submission, which is freedom. Claiming no rights, the meek man is not troubled with self-defense and self-justification. He lives in love, and therefore comes under the immediate 
a wide total protection of the great love, which is the internal law of the universe. He neither claims nor seeks his own; just do all things come to him, and all the universe shields and protects him. He who says, "I have tried meekness, and has failed," has not tried meekness. It cannot be tried as experiment. It's only arrived at by unreserved self-sacrifice. Meekness does not consist merely in non-resistance in action; it consists preemptively in non-resistance in thought, in ceasing to hold or to have any selfish, condemnatory, or retaliatory thoughts. The meek man, therefore, cannot take offense or have his feelings hurt, living above hatred, folly, and vanity. Meekness. Can never fail. O、oh, thou who searchest for the heavenly life, strive after meekness, increase in patience and per- forbearance day by day. Be thine tongue cease from all harsh words, which draws thy mind from selfish arguments, and refuse to brood upon thy wrongs. So living, thou shalt carefully tend and cultivate the pure and delicate flower of meekness in thy heart, until at last its divine sweetness and purity and beauties of perfection shall be revealed to thee, and thou shalt become gentle, joyful, and strong. Repine not that thou art surrounded by irritable and selfish people, but rather rejoice that thou art so favored as to have thy own imperfections revealed to thee, and that thou art so placed as to necessitate within thee a constant struggle for self mastery and the attainment of perfection. The more there is of harshness. And selfishness around thee, the greater is the need of thy meekness and love. If others seek to wrong thee, all the more is it needful that thou shouldst cease from all wrong and live in love. If others preach meekness, humility, and love, and do not practice it, trouble not, nor be annoyed, but do thou in the silence. Of thy heart, and in thy contact with others, practice these things, and they shall preach themselves. And though thou art、uh, no declamatory words, and stand before no gathered audience, thou shalt teach the whole world, and thou becomest meek. Thou shalt learn the deepest secrets of the universe. Nothing is hidden from him. Who comes himself into the cause of causes shall thou penetrate, and lifting one after another, every veil of illusion shall reach at last the inmost heart of being. Thus becoming one with life, thou shalt know till life and seeing two causes and knowing realities, thou shalt be more anxious about thyself. And others, and the world, but shall see that all things that are, are engines of the great law, canopied with gentleness, that I shall bless where others curse, love where others hate, forgive where others condemn, yield where others strive, give up where others grasp. Lose where others gain. In their strength they shall be weak. In thy weakness, thou shalt be strong. Ye, thou shalt mightily prevail. He that has not unbroken, he that has not unbroken gentleness, has not truth. Let's repeat this. He that. Has not unbroken gentleness. Has not truth.
He that has not unbroken gentleness has not truth. Therefore, when heaven would save a man, it enfolds him with gentleness.